Right. First of all, thank you all for inviting me. It's incredibly kind of you um, to give up your afternoon and evening to spend some time with me. Um, I, I think Lynn's uh, summary of my career is very generous. <laughs> I've only really been in education now for about 13 years prior to that. Um, I ran my own design practice. Uh, which I started while I, in, while I was in school actually. So um, I spent a lot of time in the profession, always coming into schools, very interested in, in, in many ways, rehabilitating myself and also um, students and academics that I worked with by kind of being a different, I suppose, a different kind of educator, thinking differently about what architecture's agenda should be. And I suppose this book, like many of the others, are not only a catalogue of my views, but very much, I think, a form of protest because all of them really try to confront things that I think need to change about architecture. So here are some images of them. Um, I will talk through about them briefly and then I'll focus on one before I talk more about architects after architecture. Um, I'm obviously very interested in what education is. I certainly think from a personal perspective, education for me has been completely transformative. I wouldn't be, have ever had the opportunity to go to university without scholarships and state grants when I was younger. I didn't come from a family of means. No one in my family even left, even finished school. Um, in other words, they left when they were 14 and 15 year old um, young people. Um, they, my dad was an immigrant and we, you know, we grew up with never a sense of education offering really anyone a transformation project. And I suppose because it served that role within my life, I felt very passionate about understanding not just its limitations and the frustrations we have with a canon or a discipline or a pedagogy or a curriculum, but much more about what it could become, the latency within our field um, that I'm always very interested in, I think, agitating and activating, hence probably becoming a dean for better or for worse. So not chronologically shown here, but again, this, this sense of trying to play around with what architecture is, the scope of it, um, in some cases with the Magnuson book, looking at restoring women who've been ignored to the canon, obviously gender profession, as Lynn talked about earlier, with some work, in a way, a kind of restorative project, really understanding why there was so much, such poor representation within architecture, why unlike medicine and law, parallel professions that have done so much more to um, achieve equity, architecture still struggles behind, despite the fact it professes to be a public serving profession. And then, of course, um, a book coming out this in the fall, which is the Pedagogies of the Global South. This reflects other, another part of my scholarship, which is, I think, where Lynn and I converged a couple of years ago at an ACSA conference. The profound concern about the need to decolonize our schools, but then, of course, only having Western pedagogies, in other words, Western ideologies and tools, if you like, to deconstruct um, what, if you like, the, the, the colonial school. And of course, as Audrey Lord once said, you can't deconstruct the master's house with the master's tools, hence trying to identify an area of scholarship that's been marginalized or ignored completely and bringing that into architectural discourse. So I'm gonna talk a bit about radical pedagogies because I suppose this is where I, I first entertain the idea that um, even the design of education remains a design project, right? We sort of think moving into an education sphere means that you're no longer an architect. And there's always been a prejudice, I think, towards academics in that regard. And yet, certainly from an administrative point of view, but even in terms of the way that we organize our thinking relevant to our teaching, um, I think that architecture as a discipline or even a practice is incredibly um, design led in the way that it's structured, not just in terms of its content. So for me, I was very interested in the idea that Beatrice Colomina was doing a big exhibition on radical pedagogies. Um, but it was, of course, and this is, you know, one of my ongoing preoccupations, uh, looking at it from a very particular region in a northern hemisphere country and then creating taxonomies of pedagogies throughout the world. But again, looking at it from the lens of its community at Harvard, who were involved in, in what was a collaborative PhD. This was exhibited in the Venice Biennale. Um, and I kind of thought I'd quite like to do a version of our own radical pedagogies that's really about allowed British educators, of course, that's my a previous community to evaluate themselves really to kind of position what their contribution was or is um, to education and then try to understand it better in relation to all of the other influences and I'll talk about those in a minute. So of course one of the first things we discovered and it's always recommended I know there's PhDs here tonight um, as well as first year students so I'm going to be 
you know, I think cavorting the xylophone of ideally not too much ideology, but certainly um, keeping it so that it's uh, compelling for everybody. And I do, do forgive me and interrogate me in the questions if you want more info. Um, but of course, what one knows and certainly PhD students know is the first thing you do when you decide what your thesis is, is to then deconstruct it. Um, so this was the process, beginning with this notion of making a claim about what radical education is, and then actually realizing that for a start radical, which one always imagines to be some sort of progressive, activist driven departure from established knowledge is anything but its Latin meaning is root. So in other words, it's about coming back to a notion of what is at the core of our field discipline practice to be discussed. Um, because as you know, it's contentious as to what we really choose to define ourselves as. So that was the first challenge because as you know, architecture is a contested space. Um, we don't have consensus over anything, frankly, and it's possibly that shifting tectonic um, environment that makes it so compelling and so compulsive and so engaging. Um, and of course, pedagogy by definition, really what we're all doing right now, certainly in terms of this lecture, is a, is a model of andragog andragogy because we're adult learners. There aren't any children here, hopefully, and I promise not to swear anyway, although that's a bad ha habit of being British. But a pedagogue is actually a leader of children, not um, and so, or, you know, and, and it relates to children's learning, not adult learning. So it's interesting that that kind of word it residually impacts upon you know scholarship all the way to you know to PhD level. Um, but also the interesting thing is that pedagogues were traditionally slaves in in the Roman Empire, and I think many of your professors might sometimes look at their workload and think, well, not much has changed. But the interesting thing is, again, this notion of leading, which is to me problematic. I don't see necessarily the idea of pedagogy as being just about taking you know, a group of young people in a particular direction. I see it as much more as, as an act of negotiation as to what constitutes knowledge or what constitutes learning. Um, and of course, the book tried to look at, if you like, lots of different variations on how architecture education had previously been challenged or disrupted, um, everything from the protests and occupations in the US in the 60s, but then, of course, going right back to this notion of what are the first principles, all these things we're taught in the first year about the classical orders, which is, you know, some people quite rightly read as, you know, the classical orders of imperialism or colonialism. So, again, these ideas, these knowledge frameworks or epistemologies um, are very problematized, especially when you think about whose interests they serve. So epistemologies, as you know, knowledge constructs um, and knowledge foundations are, were often there to assert some forms of knowledge over others. In other words, create inequality um, nationally, regionally, culturally, that was used in many ways as a framework for justifying exploitation, slavery, modern capitalism. So of course, architecture is complicit in this. Um, and so are the environments in which it was taught right from the beginning. And then one of the other interesting things, and this does really relate, I think, to because much of this book was was a DNA, I think, for um, architects after architecture, was really understanding the sort of transitory and um, nature of architectures, if you like, pedagogies and, and practices. Um, so realizing that often there's an enormous amount of misattribution um, and a lot of appropriation between regions. So again, this fluidity problematic in some ways because it's indicative of, if you like, the colonial agenda of architecture, hence international style being very popular in many African countries post-liberation. And this, some of my favorite brutalist buildings are there as an indication of that. Um, but interestingly, these, again, this kind of idea of um, reinventing a set of ideals, a, a set of principles and practices by migrating them to another region and then frankly building a, in a, perhaps a more intriguing looking um, infrastructure to house these ideas in. Um, this, there are lots of evidence, there's lots of evidence of this, even just between the UK um, and Germany, um, as one example. Um, and so one of the other things that radical pedagogies tried to do was to, um, I think, look at this idea of what else is there. If you start to deinstitutionalize architecture, then is in in some ways it is liberating it from its, you know, imperial capitalist and, and frankly expensive um, educational environment, college environment, does that do something to shift the ideology um, that it serves, if you like? Um, so again, you may or may not know this, but the Architecture Association didn't start as a school. It started as a 23-year-old and a 19-year-old protesting against the idea of um, having tutelage, which back then was how you learned to be an architect. You would work in a practice possibly for a couple of decades until eventually the person running the practice would 
allow you to treat consider yourself an architect and then you would be free so it's a form of indentured labor in a funny kind of way and these young people long before microsoft got there decided to invent this kind of each one teach one model where they created essentially a community a collective of co-educators so it's very interesting to see how a lot of these tropes repeat themselves 150 years later or whatever you go to london school of architecture deinstitutionalized independent school and again, it's kind of migrated into um, a space where rather than emphasize learning in a learning environment, it's actually kind of resituated learning in architecture practices. So the bulk of your day is spent doing very specific projects um, in architecture in, in an architecture office. And then in the evenings coming into a reflection space, a kind of a Donald Schoen-esque reflection on action environment. And of course, Another thing that I've always found really intriguing is the extent to which um, architecture education, despite its best efforts, is routinely maligned for being unable to um, prepare people for professional practice. And again, that was, for me, a, a kind of provocation that felt like it needed to be responded to. Um, so I think that that's certainly something that, again, comes back to this idea of what else, when, our, when Schumacher and Patrick imagines architecture as a particular thing, um, that environment, as for anyone who's worked at Zaha Hadid's um, practice, um, you know, is very much around a certain kind of production, a certain kind of, um, you know, models of labour, long hours culture, et cetera, et cetera, unpaid interns. And so that's his vision of what architecture is as a profession. So understandably, what he's really saying is schools, can you please ensure that you precondition students to show a life of servitude on, on low salaries with precarious employment and low, um, low promotion prospects, especially if they're um, diverse in any way, um, and so on. So and also that this is the prescription for what constitutes architectural production, independent of region, context or cultural subjectivity. So it's not that's not a critique of the work, but that's just saying that is the definition and, of, and a very pervasive one within architecture. So um, what when I started out with um, the, the Architects After Architecture book was maybe about, I guess, four or five years ago, um, David Gloucester, who is the education director from the ROBA coming into um, I must have been actually a bit longer than that, must have been probably around 2016 actually, came to Oxford Brooks where I was then running the Masters in Architecture program and told us that most of our, did, we didn't need to worry too much about validation, although it was terribly important that we did a bit, but only because most of our graduates would actually go on and do things besides architecture. So this obviously raised a very interesting question about why are we, why are we going to all this trouble to insist that students do all of these things when they don't actually then stay within the discipline. So there are a few things that were concerning. Uh, and one ended up becoming um, a gender profession, which is this concern over the fact that the majority of people that do leave are female. Um, and also, um, and there's very few statistics on this, but it's getting better one, I should add, um, very few statistics on BIPOC diversity and, and continuation and retention. Um, so I was really interested in understanding not just why they left, but where they went to. Um, and that was really interesting to me um, because one could argue that practices, and I'm not saying it's bad to work at, you know, Hadid's architects or anything like that, no defamation suit impending, but more the traditional model that allows for models of exploitation, hierarchy, poor promotion, you know, disaster for parents, dot, dot, dot. Um, that's a very, those are not clearly, that would put somebody off, you know, staying in that working environment. So one could say that the profession is implicated. But then what I also discovered is the majority of people leaving, um, if you like, architecture were doing so during their education, insofar as, as an illustration, 50-50 male-female students enter an architecture degree, but by the time you reach registration, you're looking at between 20, 30, 40 percent of female. So the majority, that 50-50 is lost during their training. So that implicates schools as well. Um, so I was very interested in this. I wanted to understand, you know, obviously that sadly there are no grants that support scholarship to look at two regions, but I could get funding from the European Union. So the question then for me became, you know, and this is where initially our first kind of working title for the book was the architects, um, architecture's afterlife. Um, but, you know, it's very, I just wanted to understand where are they going and, and, and is this problem necessarily unique to um, the UK or is it the same across Europe where what we have under EEA, which is the European Economic Agreement, not the EU separate thing, anyone in any European countries in the EEA, have what we have what's called a, um, 
a mutual recognition agreement among all EEA members, which means that you can qualify in any region and practice in any region without having to take regionally specific um, exams. So in a way, it's easier to move around in Europe than it is around America, because you don't even have any NEAB in every state, so it's a bit more complex here. Um, so we put in a big bid for um, European Commission funding. I say we, there's five other um, people, two, what, two others are deans, um, who did a big commission with me, a uh, big funding application to the commission. And um, it took us a couple of goes. It was very interesting, actually, because our first um, submission, we wanted to look at why students were leaving. So we wanted to look at the gender race dynamics of, of what, what was you know, damaging in, in many ways and what was getting students to leave before they even got to the end of their studies. But no one really wants to invest in pedagogy as it turns out. It's not really an area one can easily secure research funding for. But when we argued it in terms of the impact on the industry and also other industries, like where are these afterlifers going? Which industries are they impacting upon? Then we were far more successful. So we resubmitted it just to focus on, on the industry. It doesn't mean that it isn't important to still look at the impact education itself has on this hemorrhaging of talent and diverse talent at that. But uh, it wasn't something interesting really that we could get financial support for. So if you go onto the Erasmus website, you will find a description. It's much longer than this but it obviously just took a snapshot it gets a bit tiny text otherwise of the study the different countries involved obviously the UK has now left Europe which is fun we managed to cling on to the money but um, and the project to some extent um, but it, although it's challenging doing it across this region but there are as you can see five participating countries Italy Belgium the UK um, Croatia and Spain. Um, we are all all had turns really at some form of academic leadership and all had or still have architecture practices, um, which I think is quite useful um, for us. But we got 500,000 euro and we're continuing the project. And if you're interested in it um, later, I can put the links in the chat and you can read more. We actually have our own dedicated website now and continue to collect data through this, the survey. So what we had identified and that we succeeded in getting funding for was the study that explicitly wanted to look at the extent to which architecture graduates were migrating into other sectors and it had to be across EU member states because that was the precondition of Erasmus because it is EU funding um, and to understand whether that was just you know limited to a couple of countries or it was universal because then if it's universal then really architecture as a profession is really heavily implicated um, and of course what else we wanted to understand is what elements of architectural education are most transferable so in our survey we asked people questions about the skills that they um, still use both within if they stayed in the profession, but also the skills they've taken into the other careers that they have. So it's not just about cataloging all the different sectors, but trying to understand which elements of what we teach in architecture schools have this kind of multi-sector applicability. Um, and the really interesting thing is, and just as an illustration, in architecture schools, most students, most of you, I imagine, will invest many hours in doing three-dimensional renderings, in doing CGI work. Um, whereas if you went and did a film studies degree, you might get two or three weeks doing CGI. And I know this because I've actually looked at curriculum coursework descriptions for film studies degrees. So I'm not saying this lightly. I'm saying factually, this is what having correlated a few um, course descriptors. This is actually what, what you'll expect in the three to four year undergraduate degree you do. So, of course, one of the things we anecdotally identified in an early stage survey we did for this was that, in fact, architects are incredibly sought after graduates for the film industry because of their ability, not only in set design, which is the obvious one, which is at first where we imagined people might go, um, but also because of this ability to work in three dimensional space, sequential time, understand complex structures, all the kind of things that actually really pertain to, um, you know, one of the dominant mediums through which film is uh, articulated and expressed. So, of course, one might come to a careers advisor age 18 and say, I want to become you know, I want to do filmmaking when I'm older and, and obviously the, the unknowing careers um, advisor would send them off to a film de undergraduate degree when in fact they'd be better off getting an architecture degree. So that's just one anecdote, but really indicative, we think, of, of just the ways in which um, architecture as a skill set um, is very valuable and possibly even more so because actually we did some salary comparisons between filmmaking, uh, you know, like virtual studios, as they're called, in, film, in the film industry and are, are actually the salaries of, of graduating architects within the first 10 years. And you're better off going working in film, as it turns out. So, again, these are all push-pull factors that transcend things like, you know, region, race, gender and so on, but interesting to consider. And that's what this study is really trying to do. 
And of course, you know, and it's a huge preoccupation in the US as it is in the UK, you pay a ton of money for your education. You know, it's actually a, a, something else I rail about quite often whenever I've got the mic on this subject. But, you know, there has been so much evidence um, from a range of studies that argues the case for making education free. It's it, having debt curtails your life in terms of your ability to have, do, you know, have further study, uh, have a house, buy a house if that's your thing, um, buy cars, have holidays, have kids. And ultimately all that does then, if you're not actively taking on loans or working to buy new things, because you know this is under capitalism, but you know, bear with me on this one, then actually you are less likely, you're reducing the net um, wealth of a nation because <laughs> the debt is holding you back from making those investments, whether they're personal or professional. So that's one thing. Of course, the, the second thing to consider is the fact that in the US, and it's exceptional here, when you die, your debt does not die with you, it's transferred to your family and your children. So student debt is in many ways, and if you haven't seen a fantastic film called Ivory Tower, I recommend you look it up on, I think it's on Netflix, but it's def definitely on iTunes. That is a very, very, very startling eye opener about American higher education and the cost imperative, and why so many economists are calling student debt in the US the next subprime mortgage collapse so a bit like the 20, 2008 recession so bringing us all back from the precipice of that for a moment what is the value of an education right well obviously it's an ability to advance yourself to give you opportunities to become a professional in a conventional sense so architecture of course gives you that but the argument here is that it also gives you another thing so on one hand you have this very long education uh, which is incredibly challenging and economically um, challenging in itself. But on top of that, you, you know, remember that you know, you're being infused with all of these different skill sets, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, um, that really offer you an opportunity to um, have this transferability, this agility even in the face of uncertainty. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So Adam Smith, who you may know, was a Scottish um, economist used to talk a little bit about exchange value and I think it also relates really to this idea about again the value of architecture and I'm talking here in monetary terms I'm not talking about the social and the civic yet or even the ecological I'll get to that but I just wanted to make a point here about this notion of you know what what's the difference really between exchange value versus value and use well an exchange value is when you just buy a car right and you obviously you hand over money and you get a car um, and then you have a car but of course the value in use is every time you want to go anywhere in the car, you have to make sure there's petrol in it or gas, as you say, right? Um, or you have to make sure that the tires aren't flat or um, that, you know, you've got the latest accessories. And then every year you pay for its servicing and its MOT, as we call it in England, uh, which is a kind of, you know, checking it's not about to crash into a tree kind of analysis that we are legally obliged to do for insurance purposes. So it's understanding, of course, then that, you know, an education should, if it is, of good value, of high value, allow you, I think, to kind of find other ways and other instances in the same way that a car is in, needs a new set of tires, a car needs fuel, a car needs servicing, a car needs cleaning, repairing. These other opportunities for you to be able to demonstrate the value of what you first purchase, i.e. your architectural education, in a range of different contexts. So um, a future for architecture. This was kind of where I got to when we, and, and still remember, we're doing the study, the study is another year, the European study, and, and obviously we'll, I may come back and show you the terrifying data about that now. I'm sure it's gonna be really interesting, give you lots of hope about your potential careers in future. Um, but I also wanted to kind of step back for a moment and just think briefly about, you know, why even, why care? You know, why, why just, why not be, have an easier life? You know, just teach you stuff that we've taught you for decades. Why should any of your professors be interested in constantly critically re-evaluating what you're taught and thinking about its relevance to things. Well, first of all, we need to start thinking about what is the future of for architecture beyond necessarily an, an en masse migration into other disciplines. Um, first of all, what we know is, coming back to this idea of skill sets, that architecture isn't really a discipline. And this is Jane Rendell's conceit. She's written about this. She's a brilliant um, uh, writer at the Bartlett in London. Um, but she talks about the idea that architecture is in many ways the kind of, I, well, I define it as a love child of many epistemologies and disciplines, but this kind of 
weird amalgamation of lots of different methodologies, lots of different knowledge frameworks, lots of different processes. Um, and so, of course, architecture, with all of this kind of immersion and absorption of different ways of doing things from other disciplines, in some ways, is you could almost pass out so much of what we do into all these other disciplines and, and things. And that actually shifts around what really is the territory of architecture. So some people get terribly kind of protectionist about this and they say no 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 architecture is this but I think we need to sometimes invert that understanding of what we are because it's our if you like it's the fact that we have been so influenced by and in many ways um, kind of infiltrated even by these other disciplines and knowledges that gives us a familiarity which is exceptional now the graduates have this skill set you know think about a, the closest degree that's as you know works as hard as you guys do and it's basically going to be medicine and that's still very specialized around bodies so um I think that, you know, architecture has this connectivity, which is, again, a clue as to why it's so agile in a, in a multi-industry kind of way. But the other thing to remember is that aside from all of that, Rome is burning and not, in, and not in a kind of architectural way, but more in a planetary way. So a couple of other things that we need to always factor in to, before we get conceited about what architecture is and isn't and how resilient and robust it is, is just to sort of a moment, have a moment's humility to consider will architecture even exist in the future? So statistics like this, which has come from IFTF, it's also cited in US Mori poll data, um, suggests that by, well, certainly within the next 15, 13 to 15 years, um, most of the jobs we'll be doing haven't been invented yet. And that some, sounds convincing. One could argue that's precisely what happened in the Industrial Revolution. We went from agrarian cultures um, to industrialized ones. And of course, one minute we're cutting hay and the next we're running underneath a, a loom in a, a huge polluted mill on 16 hour shifts, trying not to get killed and um, that kind of thing. So and obviously one could argue that's still uh, actually still happening in some cases. But the interesting thing here is, of course, that we don't know what that next revolution will be, if it will be one that's something seismic and in that way it could be triggered by a number of factors. Um, but it's worth just thinking about what would keep architecture um, alive, if you like, or what, what, why should we assume necessarily that it will survive into this residual 15%? Is it just an echo of the skills or will it be a different way of doing things? These are all questions to think about. And of course, we do know as well that um, most of the jobs um, universally uh, that we're all doing will be lost to automation. And as we know with BIM and so on and the various technologies we have and, and so on, you know, very soon it seems like the, the incursion some fear onto architectural production um, will in fact um, reduce many of the di dimensions of our job to the point that you know again we might need a redefinition of what architectural production actually is just something else to consider and this is bank of england data but it's global um, and of course with, you know the elephant in the room or possibly not because the elephant's extinct is to start thinking more about one of the most pressing concerns of our time and that's a climate crisis um, so we know that we are five degrees away from the sixth mass extinction, by the way, the last um, five extinctions, um, most of the life on the planet between 74% and I think 92% was wiped out completely. So a bit like architecture, will, will the anthropocentric world in which we live actually uh, persist beyond um, to the sixth mass extinction? We don't know. We don't know. But this is, again, something to consider when we start looking to what are the critical issues that architecture might seek to, to engage in in order to assert its relevance past 2035. And we also know that architecture's not necessarily got, um, coming back to this idea of, of a radical agenda, this lack of consensus means there are architects who quite comfortably, and I can still call themselves legally an architect, will design um, a wall between in the US and Mexico won't lose their license for it. Um, you know, again, we know that architects can specify um, scarce rainforest timber construction. And interestingly, we are the main users of rainforest timber construction. How is how is that not a policy problem? How can why isn't AAA standing up to that, among others? Big questions, not necessarily too difficult to answer, however. And of course, we know that we have uh, global slavery. So coming back to this notion of decolonization, well, for many um, that, you know, colonization is still alive and well. We have 60 million people making stuff for us all the time um, and who are actually slaves, um, not to mention child labor um, and other forms of indentured labor in the construction industry in the US. 7% of the workers are actually modern slaves. And it's a lot to do with people, obviously, who have no visas or working rights um, within the US um, coming through indentured labor. So paying somebody a ton of money to get them into the US. And then they have to pay off that debt for decades. 
we also know that you know we are a bit object object oriented aren't we as architects we always think that whatever the question is the answer is a building it's like a form of spatial Tourette you know okay this community has got terrible housing building you know it's like okay we've got an issue with refugees building and it's like hmm, okay interesting what if we started to think more less about this the allure of you know object um, production and it's the kind of triple o counter argument perhaps but this kind of like almost you know um i think almost like a muscle a jerk a sort of tick of product producing spaces without some mitigation around whether or not a space or a building is necessarily the solution at all um, we're subscribers to this um, we're not just we're not we're part of this particular problem and of course thinking back to specifications specifications as you know you probably know this um, the empire state building in new york is largely made from a quarry in england um, most of the materiality that was shipped across oceans and also steel for it was brought from all over the us and and the pollution values attached to that as kilmo talks about um, in his um, empire state building book um, are really quite challenging to read but nothing much has changed in in, in regard to that even today um, so on top of that we know that we uh, in addi addition to this we we have pollution issues surrounding things like um even the, the the fabrics and synthetics we specify within our buildings and so on but again we're all complicit contributors to this along with just global waste and this by the way was this statistic is five years old so to think that within a within a space of five years it was doubling on what it was in 2020 is somewhat alarming i think potentially covid slowed things down briefly at least but um it's again and concerning to think that this is what we are, what we stand for, apparently. And again, the internet produces more than 830 million tons of CO2 every year. Um, you know, so much of what we do is, is data driven, it's data um, dependent. Um, so again, even if we, if the, the production of what we do relies heavily on creating CO2, um, and again, with e-waste, we're hardware dependent as well, um, the contribution we're making to this um, environmental catastrophe and of course this idea of other species having a, a stake in the game I mean we are you know we privilege anthropocentric architecture over any other species in fact we normally obliterate other animals in order to create um, anthropocentric architecture and that's all we ever teach you in schools didn't ask you to design multi-species habitats can't imagine you know why not but it's interesting that's never really been questioned um, and of course what we do though and we do it very well is design the millions upon millions of, of animal housing um, for the animals which are um, in captivity for the single purpose of turning them into foodstuffs. Um, so again, where we our relationship with animals and certainly our, our animals understanding of architecture to them is just literally something to run from. So of course, where does that get us? Well, you know, on the edge of discourse is conversations and necessary conversations about needing to sort of, again, I think, push back on some of the assumptions about architecture and, and some of the things that it does um, and is, has been allowed to do um, because no validation or NAB or RIBA or NCARB or AIA are willing to necessarily stipulate otherwise. By the way, if you put in any of these search terms into any of the, the mandates they have, their documents, their validation criteria, you won't find any of them. But it's interesting to think about the fact that there is nothing within our prescription, which is the burden schools carry and, and also professionally, which is through registration, which should be the burden that architects carry of to, to basically reorient us towards some form of more ethical and inclusive practice. And of course, if you read Kimberly Crenshaw's work, 1991, this would, is very much the kind of intersectionality argument she makes very keenly. So, and you're probably wondering at this point, how did I get from abattoirs to a book about the future of architecture? Well, it's a very good question, and I might not necessarily answer it in the presentation, but certainly in the chat later or in the dialogue. And I need to keep an on time because I know we're supposed to have some time for, for some discussion later. So, of course, with um, Afterlife, when you're doing a study that's very much, you know, it's a qual and quant, so the PhDs are going to know I'm talking about qualitative, meaning um, interviews, more subjective and, and allow allowing for far more kind of grounded theory based. In other words, the, the knowledge itself prevents, presents the finding rather than going in with a hypothesis you want to prove right or wrong. So that's what the qualitative data within that study does. And then obviously the quantitative is, is very much looking at statistics or you know, surveys that are very much multiple choice driven. So you can have some, some very clear metrics around um, respondents uh, data, but at the same time, that does narrow, if you like, the, the kind of edgier and incidental information that's of, of often where the really interesting insights are situated. So that's how that study is structured. Um, but what really architects after architecture really sought to be, in a way, was a facet of this 
you know, cl clearly fascination, obsession, preoccupation that I have with trying to really understand, you know, provide an evidence base really about how architects can be different. <laughs> I almost, you know, re I nearly said rehabilitated. Maybe I didn't, maybe I should have just said that. But the interesting thing is this notion of, of what else can architects do um, on the edge of architecture that's still kind of in a semi-marginalized sort of, okay, maybe you're just sort of architecture because you're really interesting and everyone's really fascinated with it. So we might just keep you in the fold for now. And then the people that have just gone off to, you know, dark or light side, depending on your perception, um, into a different kind of application of this architectural skill set. So that's what the book really sought to do. Um, and, you know, like with all Routledge books, bless Routledge, having worked with them a few times, we rebelliously had to get some our people who'd studied architecture, but then become graphic designers um, to design the book. Because again, for us, we were very controlling <laughs> aesthetically, but also it felt important as all three of us have kind of come in and out of our architecture and have this kind of you know troubled um, relationship with it but in a good way in a way we feel is what makes it interesting for us and makes it engaging is to not rest with it you know but to constantly you know be uncomfortable with it um we wanted to make sure that everyone involved in it was had that sense of you know edge or ambiguity around um working within architecture's prescriptions so this is a summary of, of the chapters in it i won't talk, talk through all of them but I will talk briefly about this notion of plus and beyond. So plus for us were people such as Jeremy Till, you know, is um, a VC vice chancellor at um, Central State Martins in London now. Um, and, and, you know, so people who are kind of establishment in the conventional sense, but he was talking very much about climate crisis. Um, we included, you probably know Pascal Sablan, who's done loads of work, a Pratt alum actually, um, she's, been, she's now the president of NOMA, looking at her work in relation to activism. Um, and of course, other people who, um, such as Liza Fjord, if you've heard of Muff, Muff in England is, well, I think hopefully you know what it means, because I don't know how polite or not polite people are in Illinois, so I better not say, but you can Google it later. Um, but this was an all-female architecture practice, one of the few um, in the UK that's still going, in fact, um, but very, you know, again, working on a, in a very intimate way with communities. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll give you some more detailed examples in a moment. Um, but, you know, you probably recognize a few of the names. So these people are somehow in the kind of plus space in that they have a relationship, even if it's just like literally a toe in the pool of, architect of mainstream architecture, but otherwise really on the edge and leaning right over. And that was interesting to us because, you know, in all of these practices, there was not just a departure from the application of architectural activity in this transferability paradigm, but also um, every single case study was very much around coming back to my rather dystopian presentation about a dying planet was conscious of questions of diversity, inclusivity, um, and by implication, um, matters of, of, of sustainability relative to both communities and the planet. So, um, and then of course, beyond, and I, again, I'll, I'll give you more detailed examples in a moment. These were people who'd just gone, you know, they'd lost to us all perhaps in some ways, but were certainly doing things that were just outside of um, what anyone would claim as our architectural activity. Um, one example is, um, and I think it's quite a fun one, is um, the Architekis, by the way, that's um, page 244, which was Blake Huddleston and his friends. Um, they had um, basically set up a company on the West Coast called Architekis, which was um, a company specifically designed to rehabilitate architects um, into tech careers. Um, and Matt Storis, as another example, was very interested in cryptocurrencies. He had become a kind of cryptocurrency guru. So again, you know, moving into financial structures, moving into tech, all of these kind of obvious places, I think one would expect um, a beyond architect with commercial ambition to travel to. But there was still very strong civic and social commitment in some of these things. You may remember Kimberly Mayer um, from the Architecture Museum in, in, um, in LA. Um, who did a, a very interesting exhibition about Black Lives Matter and uh, death under police custody and uh, lost her job as a consequence of leaning too far beyond that edge, interestingly. So even as architectural curation has an architectural edge that is conservative. So again, these stories mattered enormously, these testimonies even. Um, so of course, we like to draw pictures and we tried to show it a bit like this, which is another fun way of thinking about it. But you can see here, there was a few challenges for us regard, regarding community. It was never intended to be a British, a Britain specific book. I think we found a 
reasonably healthy balance with US UK but it was also very much about you know um, it was hard for us I think to identify practices in other continents other regions and that's I think one of the flaws of the book um, and that's coming back full circle to the architectural pedagogies of the global south book I'm doing I, you know I'm, I find it it's almost like a force field around breaking through the hegemony of Western ideology surrounding architectural education, who's in, who's out. So this was, I would say, a, you know, an admission that the book is flawed in this way um, and an acknowledgement of that. And of course, we find other ways to create categories, a taxonomy, if you like, of, of spatial production. Um, and these are just examples and I'm going to talk through them. Now, I just want to make sure that nobody's written anything in the chat that I'm supposed to read, because that happens. So if it's things like stop talking because you're finished and it's question time, then I've, okay, I've got my chat up now. No, it's a very sweet message from somebody. Thank, thank you very much, it's very kind. Okay, um, so of course, what we tried to do with the book, and I hope we succeeded, for those of you who've read it, perhaps you can let me know objectively, because um, clearly I'm not objective, um, is to sort of you know find a way initially at, at first to sort of mount, a, not a gentle critique, but to to offer a critique of, of traditional practice because I think you know one of the problems is when we have professors in schools insisting that these all-nighters and these being barked at in crits and all of this kind of like studio master kind of ideology is necessary in order for anyone to succeed as an architect then one has to somehow penetrate um, you know this these notions um, through in a way the Trojan horse of a book that hopefully students will read and, and feel hopeful and more optimistic about having an architectural afterlife that isn't necessarily as the cookie cutter version of, of the, if you like, the injustices in education. So that was very important to us. Um, sorry, slide, there we go. Um, the other thing which I think we, we did reasonably well was to start thinking again, coming back to this, you know, the triple O, post triple O arguments, getting beyond the object of ontology um, of, of, of everything being building based, every solution being building based, every process having a built outcome. And to understand that actually the, the spatial intelligence that you have within, you are taught within your education gives you an incredibly sophisticated ability to solve problems in three dimensions. Um, you know, it's been written about, in fact, um, Managing is Designing by Bolland and Colopy in 2003 talks, uh, to, uh, you know, did an analysis actually of, of Geary Studio and, and the way that they used kind of spatial thinking in to solve non-building related project problems. But you know, again, understanding there's something about the skill set that's acquired through, you know, creating a building, building as building as a problem or the design of a building as a problem at a conceptual level. And then the multi multi um, faceted ways one penetrates into the problem in order to find solutions. And that that kind of activating the three dimensionality of thought transfers very powerfully into other disciplines as one could imagine. So interestingly, this idea of kind of moving beyond this materiality and object oriented fetishization that architecture privileges um, included looking at projects like proxy address, which is again, Chris was an ex post after architect, whichever you know term he might want to choose. Um, he was very interested in this idea that unless you have an address in the UK, you can't get benefits, you know, meaning social care, or you can't apply for jobs and all these other things. So the homeless have an incredibly tough time. So he created a system that would generate artificial addresses that were somehow registered as legitimate because they were codified, that would allow people to have some form of address so they could claim that they have um, a dwelling which would help them with employment it would stop the discrimination that happens against the homeless. So it's a, a far more profound, I think, solution and building a homeless people shelter. Um, and that's kind of the argument, right? That actually some of the more profound solutions, and I'm cautious of that term normally, but for now, let's play with it, um, are actually far beyond any kind of material output. Um, sorry, mouse clicky, there we go. And in the example of Rotor, and this is the interesting thing, you know, um, one of the big counter arguments to, you know, neoliberalism, modern capitalism is its obsession with production. You saw that in my slides earlier, talking about all the stuff we make every year, 30 thousand things of no real value um because i don't think i'm gonna my life is necessarily going to be improved if i had thirty thousand more things in it by next year so you know logically it's no good um so interestingly rotor um evidence you know that their methodology is to deconstruct before constructing and to reapply what they find um, in order to create the thing they want and it's interesting to imagine a world in which a registered architect in practicing in the US would be obligated to only build a building out of deconstructed material. And as we know with climate collapse and everything else, this may be actually the future for all of us um, because we won't be able to necessarily to ship in cheap raw materials produced by slaves in hot countries, which is still what's happening, unfortunately, factually correct. 
So uh, be very interesting to see a, an architecture practice taking a conscious choice to add a degree of labor to what they do in order to create sustainable environments and certainly sustainably um, sourced environments. And then an example of um, Joel Sanders, he was looking very much at this idea of, again, architecture's ability to act as, as some form of activist agent to address marginalized. And there's a few people when I talk, maybe a couple of others are included in this slide deck. I tried to make sure that I would finish precisely on time. I got six more minutes. I promise I'm going to do this. I'm really good with this stuff. Um, but, you know, again, this idea that where architecture's focus is, our metric is not necessarily, when you think about architecture prizes, for example, what do we reward more often? And it's interesting, actually, to see recent wins, um, which have been fantastic and uh, signal a good direction for travel. But where are the more modest projects that are just about really using architecture as a vehicle to articulate inclusion you know, and take on a simple typology like a bathroom and start to think about how these things could be radically transformed um, and actually as a consequence of that to influence behaviors in ways that could address discrimination and not just provide basic utilitarian to support with people with other bodies um, and of course architecture is activism i mean arguably many of the projects uh, share multiple dimensions with each other and activism is certainly one of them that seems to bleed across many of the case studies we featured um, and you may know of Parler they're a phenomenal group based in Australia um, Justin Clark and founded by Justin Clark and Karen Burns among others um, but theirs has always been an agency committed to the idea of calling out injustice and misrepresentation towards women in the profession creating alternative databases and systems for um, women to kind of engage with and, and not just women for everybody really but just being a real weather vane on gender inequality internationally and not just regionally and of course Peggy Deemer's work um, she's featured in the book um, she does um, as you probably know what was interesting and what always fascinates me about Pe uh, Peggy is you know she was once a dean um, at a school in uh, New Zealand and uh, frightened the hell out of senior management so they found complex ways to usurp her um, and even from inside the institute so back in the US at Yale for example she's there you know ha having founded successfully an architectural union called the lobby um, which you can all join by the way students definitely can join there's a whole student lobby attached so student I mentioned to lobby as well that's always looking for members but it's very interesting sort of from within the institution mounting that disruptive call for um, better paying conditions not just of course um, for architects um, who are professions but also architectural workers and I think the, the term architectural workers is an interesting one to me because I think that everyone who works in service of architecture is an architectural worker so I think unions similarly are not just about protecting professionals but everyone involved um, devoid of hierarchy and then, of course, we included forensic architecture. I mean, it's again, as a coming back to this point about um, trying to feature international voices um, as much, much as possible. So it felt diverse in representation. Interestingly, in many cases, a lot of the sites of, if you like, the activism and the activity were distributed in regions um, where there were huge inequalities and, and our architects were not really able to operate in that space as activists. So as you know from the work, work of forensic architecture, holding, um, using architecture as a means to hold governments to account um, is one thing one never really imagines it doing. When you think back to, again, this point earlier about the border wall, if anything, architecture as an infrastructure is complicit usually in politics, whether it's refugee camps, whether it's you know concentration camps or border walls or you know whatever. So it's interesting imagining architecture to actually do operate almost as a sort of legal um, challenge, as a sort of lobby for um, injust against injustice and to hold um, uh, perpetrators to account in this way. Um, interesting that architecture can have that potential and not emphasized enough and certainly not taught enough. Um, and of course, the critique, the book certainly critiques, I think, what is an architecture practice as a business model? You know, I remember my practical professional training as being very divided around, you know, pr uh, limited liability partnership limited company you know sole trader whatever but not, never really told well what about co-op or collective or other models where there's much more horizontality and equality between uh, members so again in the case of assemble looking at what they do with communities but also collectively that they are a diverse group of interdisciplinarians working in a very i think ecologically responsible but very community-led way and creating if you like instances within communities where the kind of development of a project and its ownership um, is really very much devolved to 
the community in which it's operating so that architecture becomes an expression of their desires rather than the collectives. Um, and of course, understanding architecture, you know, as, as a means to address major challenges. We talked a bit about that earlier in, in Robert Mull's case. He's an educator in the UK, but it's done a lot of work in refugee camps. Um, this one, I believe, is the Calais camp, where I also used to work separately. We both were down there doing different architecture projects um, after they destroyed it with a bulldozer because they every now and again just bulldoze everything. And it's pretty horrific. And then these things pop up. And this was actually a school. Um, and of course, much like um, Joel Sanders, Joss Boys's work looking at disabled bodies and, and, and their incompatibility with architectural space and really questioning whether architecture actually can accurately and effectively serve the needs of people whose bodies do not comply with the modular man um, idealization of um, a metric for spatial production. And then, of course, Miriam Bellard was a fantastic uh, person to interview. She, by the way, is the, the inventor of Grand Theft Auto. So it's great to think of an architecture, um, an after architect going off and running, screaming into game design, only then to create one of the most um, significant games of all time. And then, you know, to conclude, because I did say I'd finish on time, um, you know, Again, it comes back to what does the book do? Uh, and, and it's this ongoing preoccupation I have that we are all the time as schools um, prescribed to support notions of an industry or a construction sector or a profession. And by the way, some people are very sensitive about these, these terminologies we can discuss later if you like. Um, but they, even so, we're, we're supporting an as is work, working environment, models of production and typologies of outcome. Um, and I would argue that that's not the responsibility of schools of architecture. Yes, of course, we should consider um, offering that as one option. That's important. But I think it's understanding that on top of that, we have a responsibility to evidence um, within our educational environment what other forms of application um, could be receptive to um, architectural ways of thinking and doing. Um, but in addition to that, really, I think it really comes down to this idea that we, if the majority of graduates leave the profession, um, which we know statistically that they do, um, is it really our loss or theirs that we do not allow them to call themselves architects? My argument and my provocation for this evening is, in fact, we should. We should look to give everybody the title architect um, and it's something they will always be. And then through that, understand the seismic and multi-sector impact of an architecture's architect's contribution to any context in which it's in and make in a way because we make almost declare ourselves come out of our architectural closets perhaps make ourselves conspicuous in the range of different contexts in which we're operating finally have architecture recognized as the uh, in my view the most compelling um, epistemologically rich and disciplinary diverse degree anyone could possibly have so the end of the story is simply this architecture is the best degree um, and and if the only way that I think um, it will really step forward is if it starts to allow itself to recognize and its professional recognition bodies ironically um, allow us to take that identity into all of the potential contexts and crises that we will be needing to confront in the years ahead so thank you very much <laughs>